Hi, everybody. Welcome to Studio Bridge. Today, you can see that big name, Adam Gustafson, is my guest today. Really excited to have Adam here. Um, just as a reminder, this is brought to you by uh, Visual Arts Passage. And uh, if you can help us out by giving us a like, that's always a good thing. Adam, welcome. Hey, John. Very Thank cool you. that you're here. I, I, oh, man. I, I, You know what, Adam? I've had so much fun like reconnecting with you. Uh, all our studio bridge and our, our, our drawing nights and um, uh, drawing hive has been so much fun. Um, and, you know, just the conversation, just getting, you know, getting to know you better as an adult. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> not that you weren't adult like when I met you, but I met you in 1996 at the Illustration yeah. Academy. And did you ever think in 1996 I'd be interviewing you? Um like uh as a professional um I, you know i think in 1996 i had i had more audacity than i had by 1997 <laughs> in 1996 i'm been like well of course that would work out that way and by 1997 <laughs> i went this is really hard oh <laughs> 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 uh, uh, uh tell everybody where you live adam I, I live in uh west orange new jersey just a little bit outside of uh new york city um in the the quaint foothills of whatever we call the foothills in new jersey yeah well that's a beautiful place a beautiful part of the world uh most people and yeah, most people that haven't been to new jersey don't know how beautiful it is um they think of they think of the meadowland <laughs> yeah no right you, you have to get off the turnpike if you get off the turnpike it gets very nice pretty quickly yeah and if you stay on the turnpike it's a uh, it's 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 not the right postcard to send yeah <laughs> Well, a couple things real quickly. Um, Adam, you uh, I met you as a wanting a wannabe illustrator, wanted to be a working illustrator. You've become very successful. Uh, you have over thirty books published, highly acclaimed books published. Um, I, I, not that many people can say that. That's a pretty impressive fact. And I know you've worked in the editorial world and the advertising world. You're a really good painter, a uh, great drawer, but I really love the paintings that you've been doing recently. Um, and then I have to bring up and let everybody know this right off the street. You're a really accomplished musician. Um, so if you're, you know, sometimes if you're in a, uh, uh, a bar that plays live music in Jersey around Adam's area, you might run into Adam uh, performing. Right. Yeah. I, um, I've, uh, I have really enjoyed listening because you've you know, you've posted a lot of it, little little clips here and there. I really uh, enjoyed listening to the music. So, but that's a whole other that's a whole other <laughs> podcast. That's a whole other in interview. Let's talk about the artwork. Okay. So, as I said, we met in 90, uh, 1996, which is twenty eight years ago. Believe it or not, um, and um, this is what. This was your first job in 1996. Yeah, yeah, I was still a senior in college. Uh, it was for Cricket Magazine, who I'd uh, I'd had a subscription to Cricket as as a kid. Um, I'd even won some of their art contests in like sixth grade, and um, and and I I started sending off little color copied samples of my work to just to magazines that I would find in the Barnes and Noble. Uh, want ads which aren't really want ads it, it, everyone else thinks it's the magazine section but to, like to this day i walk into bookstores and i just i just see want ads everywhere um and so so i would kind of piece through looking for people that i thought you know might hire might you know might be foolish enough to hire me or generous enough to hire me and uh and cricket um had this delightful art director named ron mccutcheon um who gave, you know, helped a lot of people start out their careers and was, it, it was like the most fine-tuned job I would like ever get in illustration. They sent you like the manuscript, they sent you the layout, they sent you measurements, they sent you, you know, like challenging but doable deadlines. And, um, and he, you know, he was very, very forthcoming with, you know, critiques and advice and, um, and more, and more work. So, um, 
interesting at that point you were probably thinking oh this is gonna be a piece of cake <laughs> that was that was it i sent out a mailer to like 12 people and like two of them gave me jobs and i was like well these odds are great <laughs> that's funny um uh, so um this is a, an image you did at the illustration academy i believe i love yeah. the fact that you know, uh that that timmy's name is in the snow <laughs> <laughs> I'm alluding to, to Timmy Trayvon, uh, who is my business partner uh, in, in everything that we do here at Studio Bridge and uh, Visual Arts Passage. Um, but I, I just I was very I was very prescient. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure he sees this um, if, if he hasn't yet. Uh, so, what was that experience like? What was it? Uh, that, no, okay. So let let me see. You went to Rowan before. I went to Rowan. Yeah. Uh, and so before, right after Rowan. You came out to the academy, and I know you got your MFA after that at the uh, School of Visual Arts. So, um, tell 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 me how all that worked. Tell me tell me what, what what a great. I know I know you really put your MFA to work because you teach a lot. Um, and but tell me how it you know what you were thinking going through all that process. Um, well, so I went through my undergrad was from a small. You know, it, at the time, it was not a very big liberal arts college. Now it's a it's giant. Um, but, you know, and then it had a very small art department inside it. But it was one of the few places, even in the country, that had an, a major specifically in illustration. Um, and when I, you know, when I knew I was going to be an art major in my teen years, I was looking for, you know, some way of studying art that I could kind of understand what it what it was, what it meant in the world, what kinds of pictures you know, you would get to make. Well, was um, that a, was that a um, kind of one of your loves outran the other one? I mean, because I know in your teen years, you were probably a musician also. Anyone to, to be as accomplished as you are musically, I know it didn't, you know, happen overnight. Um, so what was that? What, what, what was the thought process? <laughs> I, you know, I was, I was more, I was less insecure as an artist than I was as a musician. Like I really loved it. I, you know, I wrote things, I learned things, I practiced, but I was, I, it was one of those places where I really was sure that, you know, people who'd played in band, like knew more than I did. And if I, you know, I've went to a college audition to major in music, I would just clearly like everyone would know that I was faking it. Uh, and, 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 and in art, I worried about that a little bit, but at the very least I looked around and I was, I was, you know, one of the only serious art people in my high school. And so from that standpoint, it was kind of like, well, where are the, re you know, wouldn't it be nice if I went somewhere where the rest of them were? You know, that that other one person in their high school who was the kid who drew all the time. And mm -hmm. I, I, I really thought like, wouldn't it be great if there were like, you know, 20 or 40 of us in a room. Right. So uh, you're, uh, what would your parents think about all that? Uh, my dad just assumed I was going to be an art major, and he was a uh, he was an engineer. Uh, he worked in orthopedics, and uh, but but in my house, the like drawing was just what what we did. My brothers and I just that's that was playing for us. Um, we even had like modeling clay where we essentially like made our own action figures. Um, like like it was really just like a form of play until. You know, somewhere in in our teen years, we decided if we were going to approach it seriously or not. Um, but it was just how we communicated. Like some people play catch, and we drew. <laughs> That's good. I it, played catch most of the time. Yeah, <laughs> my, my dad played catch. He was I. It, he he was such a such a trooper in having sons who were not good at playing catch, but just you know filled up sketchbooks, and he would just his office was like down the street from a pearl paint store. And so sometimes he would just stop in on the way home and buy more sketch pads and buy a new eraser that had been inv invented. Or that's awesome. Uh, so that, that I'm, I love to hear that. I love to hear the encouragement. You know, I think so many, so many young artists are put in the situation. It's like you don't know what the opportunities are. You don't know. You don't know what you don't know. I've heard Sterling say that. I love that. Is um, <laughs> You really don't. I mean, I, I did the, kind of a different thing. I that's all I knew, you know, because I was around it. You know, I was exposed to it. But most people aren't exposed. It's a small, small part of the world. Small part of you know um, 
of the economy of people that make art for a living. Yeah. Um, my my mom was a was a portrait artist when I was growing up, but very like she was a briefly an art major in in college, and uh, so the way I, I would describe that, which I mean, you relate to, you're like this on steroids in growing up. But you know, I would tell people that like you know some moms you know put your drawings on the refrigerator. My mom put the drawing up if the perspective was right. <laughs> You know, so so if I drew something where the proportions weren't right or the space flattened out or the color, like my mom would be like, yeah, I don't know. Those eyes aren't right. You know, I did. You know, it's fine. I didn't draw as a child. I started drawing when I was 16 um, and uh, I was exposed to, you know, that world of the illustration world, the design world, the photography world um, built an aesthetic that I didn't yet knew I had. You know, when I started working, I, 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 you know, realized I knew who all these artists were. I knew who all the, you know, like even who their influences were because I listened to them talk about them. I was fascinated with it. I knew they, you know, they did something great, but I just wasn't sure what it was. I always say that, you know, like that, that refrigerator story that you're telling me, it's like my, uh, you know, my, actually my friends pointed it out to me is that my father did the uh, Tommy, the who rock opera when I was in high school, uh, album cover, you know, <laughs> and, and it was like, you know, he's a big deal. And I was like, yeah, that's well, dad, you know, and it's like, I, you know, that that's when I started to become interested in it. Anyway, back to you. Um, so uh, I know, I know that, that you teach now and teaching's a big, you know, kind of a big part of your life. And um, I actually just had the opportunity of visiting one of your classes. It was really terrific. A lot oh, of great, great questions. Happy. Um, but, um, what was the, you know, what was the, when you get, when you left the illustration Academy, what happened? You know, like what, 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 what was the thought I, process? I left there so excited. Um, it was because when I, when I, when I went to my undergrad, it was, yes, there were those other kids who drew and painted. And again, there were only you know, the, the, the filtering of like who was really serious about it um, came out to like, you know, a couple people. Um, and, uh, and then when I went to the illustration Academy, it was like, it was like even filtering further. Right. It was like, okay, well, college was where the other kids from high schools who drew were illustration Academy was where that other really driven person, you know, was where, where like you weren't, you weren't going to sit down and do your homework and be like, okay, well, Mine's going to be better. And he kind of looked around and like, oh, oh, this is <laughs> everything. As and but but at the same time, I it was a real being there was a real confirmation for me about things I was doing right and things that hadn't ever dawned on me to do. Like, like I was I was always looking at you know art history as almost being like, you know, like auditioning for influences, like things that that I liked or wanted to do or wanted to learn from and I wasn't you know my friends and I did that but not everybody did that and when I went to the illustration academy that's just what everybody did that's that's how your dad talked about art that's you know how Fred Otnes talked about art and Gary Kelly talked about art and they had this passion for the history of it and and looking for ways that their own like proclivities and tastes could could meld these things they loved together and and then sort of make it and then make it like useful while expressing something about themselves. No, very well said. Um, and uh, and I was like, well, that that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> did you? I mean, were you interested in the publishing world and the the book world like really early on? I I was my my so with the benefit of you know who my parents were is we had books that were well illustrated. Um. You know, my if you got a book in the house that didn't have good illustrations, my mom would just cringe the whole time. <laughs> um, and my dad on other nights would make up stories. Um, he would just sit in the dark at the foot of our beds and just tell us these, you know, really, really funny stories. Like the idea, we almost like laughed until we were exhausted and then fell asleep. Um, so so what we're looking at right now is my latest foray into that as a business model of um trying to create a lavishly illustrated book whose entire goal is um is to to make someone 
you know, laugh until they hyperventilate and then are sort of like too exhausted from lack of oxygen and have to fall asleep, which to me is what bedtime should be. Hmm. Um, and so we're looking at, at a, some sneak peek illustrations from uh, the aliens are not ready to go home, which is a, the, the text that I wrote for it, because this, this will be my second book as an author. And the text is really a litany of excuses why you're not ready to leave the play date or the party or the vacation or the weekend, whatever, whatever it is you're doing. And so, you know, you say things like, you know, we just started a game, we're playing a game and it's got lots of rules and we don't know how long it's going to go on for. But when you zoom out, that game is like making a crop circle. That's fun. Um, you, you just said something that um, just, I'm, um, thinking of the commer my commercial side of being an artist is uh, you're writing this book. So you got royalties from both sides, right? Yeah. How about that? <laughs> That's an important thing for me. My agent has been working on it for a long time. And uh, for, for a while there, you know, for maybe 10 years, people would say, so do you write books too? And I'd say, yeah, I write books. I have rejection letters to prove it too. <laughs> That's good. Which so is sort of how it goes. It's sort of like the, like, Hey, the 30th one's the charm, I think is the saying. In art so is that um do you uh your education supported the other side of it really well i mean that's a liberal arts college you went to um i you know i think the the people that i know that write books are just like have it in uh um have consumed a lot of books <laughs> you know that was their education of just knowing how books work um uh, a, a, as a writer and, and as an illustrator. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. You know, yeah, I, I think I was actually kind of a slow learner on that. Like my formal writing skills have always been pretty good, right? Like I, I don't make a lot of spelling mistakes. I, I understand grammar and description and, and I, I know lots of synonyms. Um, my sense of how a story should be structured was just, I had no idea. How it Like it never dawned on me that that they worked in a particular way um as silly as that kind of sounds um which you know because i look at pictures and i i look at them as structure and when i illustrate a book i'm constantly thinking about the structure and the arc of the story and how the pictures are going to build us through this and how we can establish things and how we keep from being repetitive but every composition leads us somewhere and has a purpose and when i sat down to write you know, I'd, I'd get a first paragraph and then be like, all right, well, now what? Um, so I, I have a wonderful agent um, named Abigail Samoon, who is, uh, she was my art director on a number of books when I was starting out. Um, and then when her company was bought and uh, and liquidated, uh, she uh, she opened up an agency and brought in people at like the ground level that she wanted to work with. No, that's cool. And, and she's been like a, a dream for my 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 uh my late blooming as a as a writer i'm, well, I'm going to come back to that because i want to ask you questions about the children's book industry because it's like um you know it's like a satellite of some of the other parts of the illustrate and in industry i mean i know there's a there you know a lot of you know children's book artists have specific specific agents for the children's book industry they have their own events you know it's again it's not you know it's not as it's not like the same people you see at the society of illustrators or even the fantasy people i mean it's a it's a little satellite on the outside yeah um, but it's not that little it's pretty broad <laughs> um so at the academy like well let's say after the academy i mean you were pretty facilitated um you were equipped to go out and get work um tell me how, tell me how that went Tell me how, and and I think I remember you talking about this recently. But tell me, tell me the the experience. Um, well, I so I I sent out um I I kept doing what I was doing, which was sending out color copies to art directors that I had researched, and and I would get a job here and there, uh, and then you know a couple, but a couple months after coming out of the academy, I I got an offer from Simon and Schuster to illustrate my first children's book, and uh. And I had, you know, you saw Lassie peeing in the snow there, and I had flying pigs and all these whimsical, wacky things. And the first book was this very earnest book uh, about a third grade teacher with cancer. 
Ooh. And uh, and my first thought was going, oh, this is not what I've been drawing or trying to get excuses to draw. Or and and then I was trying to think like why, like why did they give me this book? Um, and I think there there were there are two reasons I think going on. One was they probably weren't sure what to do with the book. And if they gave it to someone who was starting out, if I ruined it, it you know it it would only have been that much of a, a a loss for this experiment. Um, but at the same time, I think they looked at the kinds of things I was doing and sort of thought like maybe I would be able to take uh, like what could have been a very heavy sentimental book and add some levity to it because so much of it was about the teacher's fun personality. Um. And so they, it, it really turned out that, that that was what they wanted. And, and I was serious and hungry enough that I just took it absolutely serious. I just, you know, I drew, I drew the, as well as I could at the time. I painted as well as I could at the time. I met all the deadlines. I really thought about the compositions and the storytelling and who the characters were. Um, and weirdly enough, or not weirdly enough, but, but the book actually sold really well. And, but that got me my next five or six books, which were all, most of them were from the same author and they all took place in second or third grade classrooms. And so I was creating a portfolio on the side of like funny pictures while doing this, you know, very sort of serious, earnest work as an illustrator. Hmm. Uh, whereas my, my, my life's goal has always actually been to do what we're looking at here, which is, you know, aliens cleaning up an intersection after their friend has emptied an entire ice cream truck into his mouth while climbing a clock tower. <laughs> um, you know, and, and, uh, but, but I think ultimately the way I, the, the way I approached it is, is, is this truth about making art that we don't always realize when we're on the consumer side of it, which is, you know, once you've got your idea, like drawing is drawing and composition is composition and color is color. And the more work you've done, the way you hold your brush and the order you build layers in is all of that's going to be the same, almost no matter what the subject is. Um, that my compositions in, you know, a heartfelt drama aren't so different than my compositions in, you know, a wa wacky slapstick thing. I, at the very least, my sensibilities that, that drive the ideas around. Now, this is a very different intersection. <laughs> right, right. This is and this is this is where the, the kind of sentimental earnest work got me was was um this was a book called The Blue House Dog about this like stray German shepherd who was taken in by a you know a boy who you know kind of falls in love with it. And um and it all takes you know, I, I had to really think it's a sparsely written, really pretty book by um Deborah Blumenthal. And but I, I really sat down with it and kind of took it apart and said, okay, what kind of neighborhood has a stray German shepherd wandering around? You know, what kind of household, you know, has, has a, has a kid who is able to make friends with a stray dog in his neighborhood? You know, okay, the houses are probably really close together and don't have a whole lot of yard so that you can't be estranged from what's going on on the street level. Maybe trash pickup isn't so great. Maybe everyone drives like kind of old cars. Um, and then, and then I sort of decided to then make like the seasons and the dappled sunlight like another character through the book. Is did your materials change? I mean, do you think about different materials for certain assignments? You're you're very facilitated. You're a great drawer, um, and I'm just you know as you're you're developing, in you know you're getting you know book after book or just mileage. Um, it looks like your facilitation or materials kind of broaden. Um, do you make do you make that how do you make those choices yeah that's that's a great question observation because uh this book felt like i wanted to do kind of lush oil paintings with it um and and to sort of play up like these sort of like flattened geometric compositions with these you know more saturated colors and impostos and glazes and things um and it just it just felt like that was the kind of paintings i wanted to make and the publisher said oh good because that's what we wanted you to do um 
but the you know the, the sketches that they're based on aren't all that different you know my pencil drawings look like my pencil drawings and so the difference between my my gouache work which is what we were looking at in the aliens and my oil work which we're looking at here is i you know i to me it's a subtle difference it's it's there and um we're going to get to a, a book later on i think where i had actually started a book in oils and halfway through it, I realized that they had like too much weight for the subject. And I, I started the entire book again in like wash and watercolor. Um, because it, time, you just want it to be right for the subject matter. I yeah. Mean, yeah. I wanted the tone to feel right. Um, yeah. Over time, I've also kind of felt like my my personal progress, my how happy I am with my work has moved faster in the, the gouache watercolor mixed media stuff than it has in my oil paintings. And so in recent years, I've segued to doing more work, more work in gouache. And I, I think part of that was when I started doing oils commercially, it was because I was using water-based media. And I just kept using it more and more like it was oil paint. And so I realized like, well, maybe instead of pretending that I'm doing oil paintings, I should just do oil paintings. And then over time, my oil paintings, the surface of the paint got thinner and thinner and they built up more layers and translucencies and and I realized at some point that I was actually starting to use my oil painting as if I was doing gouache paintings. So maybe I should do gouache paintings. Well, um, um, you know, I think I think that, you know, that ability to change materials for the right subject matter to get the right mood and emotion, I think that's really important as an illustrator uh, to be able to switch gears and offer something uh, that's more appropriate for the assignment. Um, yeah, and it, it takes a weird level of confidence too, but in, either in yourself, but also for people to have in you to sort of say, yes, it's going to be different, but it's still going to be kind of the same. You know, like I'm not going to surprise you with something that's not what you approved. Right. Um, yeah, so this is, so what we're looking to hear, these are gouache paintings from a book about um, the first, the, the first acrobat to cross Niagara Gorge on a tightrope uh, hmm. in 1959 um and this uh, there was so much research into this just even like getting down to like what trying to find firsthand accounts of what the colors of his leotard were because mm -hmm. there's only a couple photos of it but he also crossed several times like every year he would go and cross it again doing more tricks on his tightrope so so some people's accounts are like they think they're talking about one year but it's another year there's photos that are misattributed um so it was it was this crazy amount of like book research um, to track down artifacts and uh, you know museums that had pieces of his costume in them, and uh, and th and then you know doing extra levels of research for. See now I can't even remember what this contraption is called, but I had to figure out how they were built and used, and how many men would use it. And originally the book had horses doing it and then they did more research and realized, oh no, we didn't, they didn't use horses, they used people. So I had to kind of resketch that whole thing. Um, um, which, yeah. That, that, that's an interesting thing. It's like, uh, I've always, <laughs> and I've heard this from other artists uh, that, that uh, illustrators are pretty equipped with knowing a, a lot of, a little, about a lot of subject matter <laughs> because right. they do so much research on topics that yeah, are no, it's, topical it's, it's, for each assignment or story. Yeah, I think that's probably part of where like the liberal arts education actually really does help. Um, is uh, you know, in, in art schools you do have those, right? There are literature classes you have to take, and but but at the same time you're only taking them with a bunch of art majors who may or may not actually want to be taking a literature class right there. Right. And you've got a literature professor who knows that they're not everyone's priority. You know, it's a little bit like when I, I taught art appreciation at a county college and I knew like, all right, these are not art history majors. Like these are people who came here for three credits. And, you know, if I try to get more out of them than I'm going to, I'm just going to be disappointed. You know, mm -hmm. you know that better just like sort of make, you know, tailor the experience to what they really want from it. That's pretty um, good. Identifying your expectations. Uh, yeah. Who you're teaching. That's pretty interesting. Right. You know, and if I, I found if you do that right, there are people who come out of an experience and they might actually, you might think like, oh, was this, this was really easy. And they come out going like, man, that was the hardest paper I ever had to write. 
Um, but if they came out of it not hating artists and and wanting to know more about Caravaggio, I felt like, well, I win because yeah. who any is anyone who's not an artist feel that way? Um, I would want them to. Uh, but in a liberal arts school, you take a literature class and you've got English majors in there with you. Right. There, there's no lowering of the bar. Um, no, I, 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 that when I uh, finally convinced my father that I, that I was committed to be an artist, I was going to university and he said, well, I have one rule. He goes, what, he goes, fin finish all your liberal arts. Uh, he said, the rest of it, I can help you better than anybody else. Um, and, and that was how he thought. <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, uh, he said, I can help you with the other part. He said, but I can't help you. Uh, he says, you you really need to finish up on the liberal arts side. And the, the day I was done with that, uh, he was like, OK, come come to my studio. We'll figure this thing out. And he he was great and really was the. Oh, wow. It was the. Uh, it was kind of like the beginning of, you know, thinking about the academy of 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 how should structure education, what somebody needed to, you know, the real essentials that somebody need to have. Um, one of the things my dad was just just like relentless about was exploring new artists, influences, you know, figuring yeah. out who did what and who they learned it from. Um, yeah, that's that's it. That and it's sorry to interrupt, but that was one of the things that that I. I was my friends and I were doing in undergrad, but other, you know, other people who are art majors called us art nerds for walking around with our sketchbooks or going to museums, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I remember kind of thinking like, I, I feel like this is what we're supposed to be doing. You know, yeah. I, my professors say this is what I should be doing, but I only had so many of them. And when I went to the Academy, it was this, it was like permission to dork out <laughs> and, and just and and to dig into disparate things to you know the, the the idea that you could the way to find yourself as an artist might even be to like finding ways of loving things that aren't what you do or what you can do like like thinking abstractly wasn't easy for me but your you know your your dad like actually was the one you and your dad were the ones who introduced me to Richard Diebenkorn and Elmer Bischoff and those the, the you know, these Bay Area figurative and abstract artists that like made me then look at Bonard compositions differently and made me look at tournament like I really learned how to compose but I learned to do it by like pilfering from things I loved that weren't things that I could do or weren't how I was going to express myself but if there was something I loved about it I wanted to find a way of pulling it into the way that I instinctively drew and built things yeah. so so much can be acquired i mean making art you know it's like if someone says well you're not learning anything if you're not drawing and painting every day I, there's a, a part of that i don't believe is true i think some of that i think you have to work to to grow but just taking time to research and look at art is the, the aesthetic side you know gary pointed gary kelly pointed out when we were filming him one day um we were in his studio and and Brent Watkinson asked him, well, why did you choose that color right there? And he, Gary kind of, he was almost, he got, he, he, and Brent had asked it a couple of, a couple of different ways, almost to the point it was, it was almost annoying, but he understood what, what Brent was doing. He wanted to get, you know, um, to, to to think about he wanted the answer to to be really natural and and he wanted it to be uh real You're not like oh i just it wasn't math it wasn't you know color science it was intuitive and he wanted to get to that he goes it's into i think about co color intuitively now and then he turned and he pointed to all of his books he said the answers are all right there Right. And and he and and he said, I've looked at all those books and I've made all this artwork. He goes, I know what works with the colors that are next to this and what I'm trying to do because it becomes too intuitive after a while. And to build that intuition, you have to absorb a tremendous amount. Yeah, it's a, it's all a language, right? Like every part of it, the drawing is a language, the painting, the color, but but a language. I mean it in that way where, you know. 
one day you're listening to someone speak French and you're translating French to English in your head and you're thinking about your English response and then you're translating that into French and then you say it all wrong. And then, and then one day you just, you hear French, you think in French and you respond in French. I never got that way with French, <laughs> but there, there, there are parts of drawing and painting that, that I can just think in. Right. Um, you and know so what know. we're looking at here is, 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 is this long period of me figuring it out that, you know, one of the things that I learned at the Academy um, in like this, in embracing this love of sort of like expressionism in art was that I'm kind of a, I mean, I learned this a bit in my undergrad too. I had a really great expressive drawing teacher um, and a, and a printmaking professor who was really into German expressionism. And, uh, and so I, from these people, and then, you could, I, I, I kind of learned that that I'm a slob, right? Um, and that's important because I grew up in the era of like Boris Vallejo, you know, book covers. And 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 you know, if you watch like Boris Vallejo, like, work just got tighter and tighter over the years. Um, and and you know, I'd go to a museum and and just instinctively as a teenager think like the tightest painting was the most amazing painting. And had to kind of come to terms with that. I'm not that tight. Um, and then kind of loosening, loosening up and figuring out what my brush stroke is. It's 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 a real credit to the people who hired me that that they were patient with that. Um well, or, or that they gave me projects where that would be appropriate, that I was actually, you know, well suited for these these things that I would still be allowed to like learn my craft while doing them. Um, and still, you know, do fun little things with like flattening out space and incorporating time lapses. And, you know, there's bits of perspective in this picture that don't 100% work in like a Cezanne sort of way that I was, you know, then trying to get to work within this kind of painterly, almost realist application. Right. That's what, and again, that's a, that's a tough world when you're thinking about vignettes and type and all of that kind of stuff. Vignetting something to white. Uh, when 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 a uh, a young artist deals with that for the first time, it's like oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this, and it, this is hard. It's 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 a good reason too to make lots of different kinds of friends. Like one of my best friends from my undergrad years is this really gifted graphic designer, and when we first met, it became clear that he looked he thought about type like I thought about pictures. You know he 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 liked you know he got into looking at the shape that different lowercase y's or g's would make you know and 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 thought about them in this this same way of like looking at beauty and formal you know concerns and and that inspired me i think to take these books take on books and look first and foremost at like the blocks of type that they incorporated and sort of like so i think the first thing i did on this this page was i looked at the shape that the type made and 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 looked at that arc underneath the, the the final stanza and thought like how can i lead us down into the picture and then up around something and and uh and keep you know and then build a picture after that well and you did a great job with it the i, I wanted to compliment you. my favorite part of the picture is that the last figure off in the distance <laughs> and that relationship to there that's a really that's some really good storytelling right there that's i, I really enjoy that uh, and it's well painted. Um, the um, uh, when you when you left school, were you pursuing children's book and editorial at the same time? Is that were you just trying to just kind of search everywhere? What what was? Yeah, I was, I was about that. I was approaching both at the same time. You know, it's a funny thing. Illustration, I still think, like really stresses editorial as being like. All right, you can do all these other things, but this is where the serious work happens. Hmm. You know, um, you know, this is where that, that's fu that's happens. funny. That's funny. It uh, it takes a, uh, I think almost almost a certain vintage artist or illustrator to say that because I mean it's it's we're looking at like the champions of editorial illustrators of people that came before us and what a great venue it was they had to work with. Yeah. Those venues have, are, are not, I mean, there's still, some of them are still great, but mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not, it's not the only playground anymore. Right. I mean, it's gone, it's gone other places and the fantastic places it's gone. Yeah. But I, I love editorial because 
it takes a, a it has a really wide breadth of mm -hmm. types of illustrators yes. uh, of voices and it's also the most accessible for young artists to start right well that's and so that was funny it's that's that's where i pushed myself and it just that's not where i got the most work it was like just the way that i solved problems instinctively intuitively didn't it didn't find a home there um but it but it found a home in really in what were like kind of quirky like bio biographies actually as i wound up doing a lot of nonfiction, falling on the 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 you know the way my that first book started of the like hmm this book has a lot of things going on in it um you know what could you do something with it um and so you know i i deal with people who are like you know, biographies of people who are almost who are famous and yet not super famous so this right. is a book about robbie robertson um of the band and uh that page we just looked at before was was him looking through the sound hole of, of his martin guitar and seeing the word nazareth on the uh on the bracing which is why um you know why he started a song with i pulled into nazareth i was feeling about half past dead so he needed a city and in inside a martin guitar it always says you know crafted in nazareth pennsylvania that's fun so i was like all right how do i get a camera angle that's like looking up through guitar bracing and uh and then going like wait okay he had he had a beard that year and he wore so there's there it, there was a weird amount of like crazy amount of like just arcane research into crafting that one picture and then making sure it had room for knocked out type working around it so uh dirty rats <laughs> dirty rat so this that's, that's a that's a jump right but it's, right uh... and and it, this so this was this book it, it was a non-fiction one about um about different species of rat around the world that you know belie the reputation that rats have yeah um but but it was again it was something that they they gave me because it was a very non-linear kind of book that they thought maybe i'd 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 be able to find some vehicle to like give it an arc of some kind, like visually, so that as you're getting facts, you're sort of like sucked into something happening. And so one of the things I I did is somewhere through this book, yeah, there's a there's a rat that keeps showing up who's got a little bite taken out of his ear. <laughs> and uh and so every time we we go from like talking about some rat from South America and then we're back in North America, it's it's this guy with a little bite taken out of his ear, just trying to survive in an urban environment. Hmm. That's fun. Hey, just, uh, you know, we, we kind of touched upon it, you know, when we were talking about, uh, you know, talking about some of the painters, you were looking at the, uh, at the uh, Academy being introduced to those Bay area figurative uh, artists, but uh, maybe name a couple of other, your influences, maybe bookmakers, maybe, people that really influenced you with your, you, you know, the, the narrative stuff. Yeah. Um, painting and color wise, like the, the day I was introduced to Fairfield Porter, my life just changed. I can see that. Yeah. You know, just, uh, it, 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 I just, I suddenly went, Oh, like I got him and I felt like he got me. <laughs> um, but when I got out of the Academy, one of the things that impressed me the most was how accessible artists that you like can be. You know, and and how generous they are with things they they know. And I I went to a uh, a book talk that Charles Santori was giving. And and in this bookstore talk, he gave this amazing synopsis of how he broke down a book, and 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 the stages he went through, and how he thought of the story, and how he thought about the words, and how he thought about just if someone was in profile, were they facing left or right, and how did that affect the book? If someone was in the foreground or the background, how did that scale differential? affect the storytelling um and i was so like taken in that uh my my girlfriend now wife denise and i and she had always he'd always been one of her heroes we stuck around and asked him if he wanted to go out for coffee after the talk and uh and so he said yeah we took him out to like the the barnes and noble coffee shop and then when he had to get going he said well you know i'm you know, we were we were just outside of Philadelphia at the time. He's like, well, if you're near Philadelphia tomorrow, I'm going to be in my studio. This is the address. Why don't you come by around like two in the afternoon and I'll let you in and show you what I'm working on. And we can go through my flat files. And 
Wow. I spent the afternoon with Charles Santori. He critiqued my portfolio, you know, like put tracing paper over pictures and made little scribbles on them to like show me how like someone's eye contact would change the picture. Um, showed us little mock-ups for books that wouldn't come out for like two or three years. Um, and it was just such a, you know, he didn't, there was no reason for him to be that nice to me, <laughs> you know? And, well, but, no, I, I, I think that most of the illustrators and painters that, that, that I've encountered and talked to about teaching or bring him in to teach with us, that type of thing, they really enjoy it. And mm -hmm. there's, there's immense value doing it from this side. You know, uh, there's immense value of what, what, you know, you tend to, as you're teaching, you tend to up your game um, because you start really thinking about how all this really works. <laughs> you, you know, it's like trying to employ it, um, uh, to employ what you're, you know, suggesting to the students. And you really, you really got to think about it. And, and I, I know it's made me a lot better. Um, the teaching has been very important. I and mean, all the, all the, you know, in, in fact, you know, I bring up Gary again, uh, I'm going to, for two reasons, I'm going to bring up Gary, because this was such a funny line. He said to me, he said, Johnny, because I guess got to thank you um, for giving me the opportunity to teach in such a serious way with, for such a short period of time. <laughs> he only had to do it. Yeah, like 10 days or so at the academy right so uh he i could get really involved i could be around other artists and get excited about that and just be totally immersed in teaching he said then i could go back to my studio and do what i really need to do right. um and, and and i thought that was such a funny thing for somebody to sit, be so honest about it he says i feel so like you know it it gratified me um to to feel like i'm offering i'm giving back but just for a short part of <laughs> for a small right. time. Yeah, that's the dream to be able yeah. to like really put yourself into something within the bounds of your energy levels. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the other thing I was going to bring up about Gary, because the first time I ever saw this and I, 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 I can say I have done one book, complete book, and I'll never show it to anybody. It was awful. Uh, there was like, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm totally amazed at the artists that can do, you know, 16 interiors and then a cover and it all be good. You know, I know some people like certain pieces better than others, but I had like five that I would never show to anybody out of the 16. It's like, okay. and, and so, it's just such a difficult thing. Uh, up until very, very recently. And like, I named this before I could ever address it, but there's something that I, other children's book illustrators have their own version, but I called it page 28 syndrome. It's like you've got a 32 page book and then there's this point where you, you you've got nothing left hmm. you know like and you're looking at your sketches and even going oh god this is the sketch where i didn't have any ideas left and now i have to do a painting of it and i've got nothing left and how do i just make it blend how do i you know it's like you, you know i spent like the first like seven months on quality control and now i'm just doing damage control yeah i've just went out <laughs> right um, but I was going to bring up Gary because the, um, I think it was the the Tall Chief book, but mm -hmm. it was the first time I saw Gary's process work for a book that he brought to the academy. I don't know. If, did you remember seeing oh, that? I, well, that was, I, I was. I think, but I think his Rip Van Winkle had just come out when I was okay. There. So the first time I saw all the process work, I remember turning to my good friend Brent again and look at him and go. I don't do that. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, I have to, I have to, if I'm going to, if I'm going to do that type of a project, I'm going to have to learn how to do that. Uh, but his process work and the way he, you know, he laid every, you know, the storyboarding he did, everything that he did was just freaking brilliant. Um, and you saw all the, the, the labor of love that he puts into those things um, were just amazing. So. Um, yeah, and Gary's actually always been one of my, favorites like he's just one of those people that always stopped me in my tracks when i'd stumble on his work in the wild yeah well it's kind of everybody's right you know yeah. it's like the guy's just amazing yeah. um so uh maybe a couple of other uh a couple of other influences that that uh fairfield porter um gary 
Um, Centauri, which is a great one. Right. Um, Kathy Kolvitz was was always like just very near and dear to my heart. And I love that she was like, you know, she was such a drafts person. Right. Like such like ability to do just sensitive, amazing detail. And then at the same time, there's this there's a charcoal self-portrait of hers where she's older and her face is so delicate. And then her arm is this amazing, just aggressive scribble leading up to her hand at the under the other end of the picture, holding a piece of charcoal. Well, um, she, she's one of the most emotional artists. Yeah. Uh, but and, and she she could just I I I, I don't know. I don't know what the right word for it is about about how she like metered out her emotion in her work. Hmm. That that there's there's things where like you know the craftsmanship of it is such that you you do almost have to divorce yourself from this heartfelt subject in order to just draw the nose right, right? You know, <laughs> and then at the same time have such a heavy hand with with the lithography. Your you know her woodcuts were just you look at those and. You know, maybe not to the same degree as like an Emil Nolda, but you know, you look at you like you go, okay, that was art made with someone's elbow, just pushing in with a blade to like pull this picture out. Yeah. Um, um. So these, the last one, the the uh, Courtney Love, and then the um, uh, that was Courtney Love, right? Before that's Courtney Love, yeah. And then Mary Cassatt here. This is very recent. This is just a couple yeah. weeks old. This is a this is our our drawing night drawing hive on Thursday night. I loved her hat that much. Yeah, I I have the little painting. I uh, I I couldn't get it in the first shot. I got to go back. It's one I want to finish because I uh, I I love this photograph uh, and I love this portrait of her. Beautiful. And I should tell everybody this is you know Adam sticks to the timelines on each of these. Yeah, I, again, I don't know if that was a twenty minute or forty minute pose. One of the two, but. Uh, um, I, I was actually I was really by the rules on this on this particular week. I think I actually did all four. Yeah, I, th I, I think you did four, didn't you? Did you do all four? I did all four. Yeah. yeah. So I was so, in twenty twenty twenty. So, uh, man, how how you know it's like this guy was, you know, the king king of the king of the portrait world. You know, uh, I mean, uh, as far as twisting it and yeah. and. and of what a portrait actually is, but uh, uh, if you don't know Francis Bacon, um, Bacon, just killer, great, great drawing of him, and so much like he's he's like his own. It, you know, there there's these certain people that that they're they don't fit somewhere in art history. They're just them, right? You know, like like a a painting by Francis Bacon is just a painting by Francis Bacon. There's not, and there's no question. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, different subject matter. This was a this was a last year sometime, right? Yeah. Of Andre the Giant, but this is it's so much fun to do that. I think it's, it, you know, I paint I paint landscapes most of the time, and then to the, to 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 do and as an illustrator, mostly I was painting people. I was drawing and painting people all the time. So it's you know it's a craft that I've have honed and developed. But I love going in Thursday night and just, well, sometimes I don't love it. Sometimes it's, you know, it's like going to the gym, right? right? But yeah. once you get in, you start talking and then start having fun. And um, uh, it's like, you know, you're there to do push-ups and sit-ups, right. you know? And, you know, the other thing too is because I always think about it like that, like going like, well, this isn't my, this isn't my sport. This is me running laps, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but but at the same time, it's almost like if you went to the gym and every time you walked into the gym, they had replaced all the equipment. <laughs> you know? So one of the things I, I love about doing this as as like a mental, not just like a draftsmanship exercise, but as a mental exercise is to just Thursday morning, I don't know what we're going to draw. Yeah, that's that's you know? fun. Yeah. And somewhere in the course of the day, the phone beeps and there's the four pictures, you know. <laughs> And, 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 you know, someone in the group has decided what those are, but everyone else and everyone else who's drawing along doesn't know what's coming. Yeah. And, and it, it's a little bit of, you know, for, for an illustrator, it's sort of like, if you, if, if you like that, then illustration's a good place for you to be because it's this need to like apply yourself 
to something that you might not have thought about drawing otherwise. Yeah, that's, um, that's and people will often give it to you and trust you with it based upon things you did want to draw. Adam, something that's always amazed me about the illustration world was getting the illustrator's annual or spectrum or communication arts and, and going through and just being, you know, just sitting there and thinking, God, this work is terrific. And then you have to sit there and think about none of these people knew what they were going to do. They they didn't they didn't know this job was coming. This was somebody else's problem they were solving. They didn't get up one morning to decide I was gonna, you know, paint Francis Bacon. You know, that um that was an assignment that they took on. And the, and they're so good at addressing the assignment. Besides them being beautiful images, uh, they're functional at the same time. And that's that's always like really impressive to me. So this, this picture we just came to, speaking of that sort of thing, when I first signed with my, this book came about um, at the same time as the Robbie Robertson book. Uh, I had just signed with my agent and she made her first trip to New York, you know, with her agency. And she walked into uh, an editor's office and the editor said, look, maybe you can help me out. I've got, you know, a couple, you know, biography, nonfiction books. And I need someone who does, who's done like, is up for like really heavily researched nonfiction, but can deal with likeness in a way where it doesn't feel like self-conscious portraiture, but they can turn them into, turn real people into characters in their book. And God, if they were a professional musician at the same time, that would take so much off my mind. <laughs> it was like a, a, a portrait of you. <laughs> right, right. So that's where I, I got this book about the Beatles as as like, you know, kids meeting and, you know, forming their their band, you know, all the way up until like the Ed Sullivan show. And uh, so I had to track down their first guitars. I had to track down like where they lived. There is a photograph of Paul McCartney's mom's couch. So I had to make sure that was right. There is not a photograph of George Harrison's like apartment. But I, I could do I had to do all this research on like what kind of housing was built after all the bombings of World War Two. You know, what was 1946 like low income housing that his family would have moved into like um Beatles, right. don't don't research that number i just gave you i'm just making up that yeah but you know there are black and white photos of ringo's car but i had to find out what the actual color was from anecdotal evidence <laughs> um, and uh but you know with, with the guitars in this so many of them are in like the rock and roll hall of fame or they're in a hard rock cafe somewhere but if you look at them now some there's one or two of them that are like almost look like they're a green sunburst um, and that's because the red dye that was used in like these brown tobacco sunbursts in like German made cheap guitars of that era, the, the red was this fugitive dye that would bleach out over the years. So when the Beatles would have had these as their first guitars, they would have been like kind of reddish brown sunbursts that are now look kind of like olive green in their, their current state. And that's, it's just this weird little bit of knowledge that I had about guitar finishes that's so funny to see you know the second read to see the drummer in there yes. um you know and, and it, it, you did you handled that beautifully uh, so you know the fact they're in the bathroom the bathtub is the subject <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. right it, it, this is the fun thing about illustrating you know that the text gives you something and then you kind of go like but who is the real star of this picture you yeah. know sometimes the star is someone's hand sometimes the star is dappled sunlight sometimes the star is a the clawfoot tub yeah that's just awesome great piece uh, uh, no, go ahead oh i was gonna say like fun fun things sort of wander into your life as an illustrator like i i i felt better hearing cf Payne talk about this once where he was saying like well you yeah, know i I've, he's done time magazine covers and he's like and i've done things for like you know the the, the elks lodge or whatever his example was like <laughs> Just you, you get to know people, they know you as the person, their artist friend, um, and then they trust you with things. Like there's for every opportunity that comes from direct mail and tracking down art directors. And there's also someone who just goes, you know who won't screw this up? My friend, because they're my friend, <laughs> you know? And, 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 and so people will hire people they know just because there's less stress for them in it. You know, like they go, well, 
you know, I'm going to see you on the street. So you're not going to make that awkward for us. Um, and so this was um, a group of a number of people I know, one of whom was this um, illustrator who I like, really looked up to when I was starting out, Lara Tomlin, um, who uh, did a lot of work in, in the New Yorker and Atlantic Monthly over the years. Um, particularly like in the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, you know, she was in that group with like Natalie Asensios and Tim Bauer and people that were like inescapable when I was when I was getting started. And um, but she she now lives like a town over from me and we become like buddies through this like painters in the park or you know, plein air thing she started doing twice a year. And then in that town they decided to she and someone else decided to put together like this, like variety, like old time variety, sh family variety show. And she kind of pulled me in and to do, to do the por poster for it. That's great. That's fun. The artist friend, right? Yes. Yes. Right. He's the art guy. Um, yeah. It, it, I, right. I, I've, 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 I've had, had a few people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I've had so many opportunities that came for just from like people I knew on the playground dropping my kids off in the morning, you know, who, uh, and, and some of them actually did have art backgrounds and I didn't know it. We were just dropping our kids off. And as we slowly found out what we both did, you know, mural opportunities like came my way. You got the frog. Um, I, my, up my debut as an author illustrator. This is it. This is it. This is the froggies do not want to sleep, which is exactly what it says it's about. Um, and it's it's a narrative that just gets it, it's actually a metaphor for play that that as a child playing, you start playing an actual game, then you might start pretending to do actual things. And if you're left to follow that through, um, you, you go from pretending you're driving a car to, you know, why not? Why not a spaceship? And if you're in a spaceship night, why not land somewhere? And if you're going to land somewhere, why not meet who lives there? And 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 as the, the the play builds, you know, your your internal story making and world building like just kind of takes on on its own. And the last thing you want to do at that point is go to bed. Um, what, what I love about this is the choice of the car for the frogs. <laughs> of course, I, they would choose that. <laughs> of course, right? Of course, someone gets the rumble seat, and and I was really excited about giving it a a damselfly hood ornament. <laughs> Right. And I, I sort of thought, you know, every now and then children will ask me about the, the planets in the background. And I'm just sort of going like, you know, I almost wanted to get the impression that they're like, oh, these guys again. So so when you're doing a book, like when was it different? Um, are you are you producing the book and then going after the publisher, publisher coming to you and just saying, hey, here's the idea. I mean, how how, how does that come about when you're doing both sides? Right. That is it, it really it throws the process off in this funny way. It would be sort of like like you make a movie trailer and if someone gives you money for it, then you have to make a movie about the thing you just made a, you know, pretended you're making excerpts of. So in this case, the whole book has to be written and edited, sketched out and made into a dummy. And, you know, maybe one or two pieces, one piece goes to final to show what the whole thing is going to be. And then it gets shopped around. And then if it gets picked up, then you're back to start and you're re-editing it and you're, you know, going through and figuring out if you still need to re-sketch things. Um, the second one was a little smoother in that way. It really was just selling the manuscript and saying, trust me, we'll have pictures. <laughs> so now you take a completely different turn. Um, you know, all of a sudden, you, you know, I'm thinking NC Wyeth here. I'm thinking, you know, great, great, you know, early American romantic illustrators. Which gets uh, us to my other, like, favorites, the other world that I just, you know, I'm in in my head. And uh, this was, I was approached to illustrate an English as a second language edition of White Fang uh, being published as part of a South Korean English speaking program. Um, so these were like published in like an online reading program in South Korea. Um, but the art director and editorial staff were in North America because all all the writing is, in, you know, these classics of English and American literature. 
And so the editor of this was a former, we used to work together in an art center. And a couple of years later, he called me up to see if I would want to be put in his roster of illustrators for these projects. So I, I did 186 of these in uh, the course of a year. Wow. Um, when you do 186, some come out better than others. <laughs> I have, I've curated a little bit of what we're looking at here. I, you, I think I did a pretty good do, batting when average. When you do five, right. one comes out better than the other. That's right. <laughs> um, but it was, it was, it, and, and, and there was something to be said for it. Like when he told me what the book was in my head, I went, all right, woods, lots of snow, wolves, and all the people are going to be wearing heavy, dark overcoats. Okay. I think I can do that in a deadline. Um, and then it turns out there's this campsite, maybe an hour from my house that has a wolf preserve in the middle of it. Oh, um, cool. So I just went there and I was just like shooting photos through chain link fence of wolves doing anything wolves would do for the hour I was there. Just so <laughs> I had this, this like, you know, Google photo encyclopedia of, you know, wolf sleeping, wolf standing, wolf squatting, wolf turning left, wolf turning right, wolf, yeah. Uh, and then I got to be like a landscape painter and got to do that really terrifying thing you do when you've you've painted a nice composition, then you take a toothbrush full of white paint <laughs> and you just flick the whole thing and hope for the best. You did a good job with it. Thanks. Right. And I got to learn how like Inuit um, sled dog formations work. Yeah. I love I love this piece. Very Thanks. well done. Uh, and this was my this was my second foray into doing murals. I wouldn't have applied for this if I hadn't done the first one, which was behind my children's elementary school. Um, I, I spearheaded a mural project that was all about the animals that ch local children see in their backyards while living in the suburbs. Um, but so then this came up and uh, this is on a New Jersey transit uh, train station stairwell. And cool in like the new arts district. But what I noticed they were doing is everything that was getting refurbished or gentrified in the neighborhood was being named after the hat industry. Cause this is where like Stetson hats used to be made. Um, and you know, any, any manner of like elegant, amazing hat industry from the glory days of people wearing hats was in orange, New Jersey. Um, but only until like 1923 and by 1923, all the factories had emptied out and the entire neighborhood had been completely abandoned, you know, and uh, and then, you know, people lived there for another hundred years. And mm -hmm. so when they started naming everything Hat City something, I wanted I pitched a mural that was going to be like just, you know, a love letter to like everyone who's actually been living here for the last hundred years since the hats left. But then as identified by their own like cultural hats. Uh, so this is where we get into my, it's a wonder that I, I don't do more high profile work because this was my idea of self-promotion. <laughs> I would, uh, I would read, I, I sent out a Christmas card one year and realized that every illustrator sends out Christmas cards. So if you're an art director, you get 30,000 Christmas, homemade Christmas cards. And I, as I started looking at other holidays that exist, but that are obscure. And I thought, well, how many people are getting cards for National Grammar Day? <laughs> And so I started right. I would write a little, like little, almost like flash fiction blurb to go with the holiday, and then I would illustrate my own blurb. And and in my head, what they're sort of doing is saying, "Look, I can paint old people. I can paint young people. I can paint shiny things. I can paint animals. I can paint landscape elements, and tell a story at the same time." These are fun. And so for like ten years or so, I did those and. But doing those actually got me like quirkier projects. So so now I kind of divide my time between this earnest historical fiction and things like this was a book called Lost and Found about a, a boy who loses his hat that his grandmother gave him, uh, that his grandmother made him. And he's afraid to go to the Lost and Found because this is the custodian. And when he finally just runs out of options and has to go there, he finds out that no one in the history of the world has ever gone to the custodian and so and the, the author who wrote it, it like he wrote it like to be like in the it was like a dream for illustration because 
it 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 featured lines like in there with the biggest box I've ever seen. And that's it. Or it says, you know, there was all kinds of stuff in there. You know, I climbed in and there was all kinds of stuff. And that's it. Now I had to go like, all right, how do I illustrate that? What's it going to be? Um, I brought the things I found to show my friends. They thought it was great. You know, so so that's I got to throw like the Nikkei of Samothrace in the Lost and Found. <laughs> um, sculpture over on the right, the light sculpture. Right, yes. I, the only reason um, I knew I, I just drew it. <laughs> for, oh, really? <laughs> I used it as a, as my figure model for a foundations class. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, and then around the same time, I was like that book was followed very closely by this book about the uh, the woman who won the 1922 gold medal in shot put in the women's Olympics. And she was this like six foot one, six of this really tall, lanky. I mean, the, the, the historical figure like looked like I had drawn her she looked like i made her up um which which i said that to the editor and they were like going well yeah that's that's why we gave it to you <laughs> <laughs> that's what we were that's what we were expecting right right uh this is another mural project this was for a pedestrian underpass at a train station uh and so i i pitched an idea of you know you know well this is a tunnel that we're getting to work and getting home through. So what if we just wow. take tunneling things and on their, you know, and all the reasons that they might be going, you know, back and forth in the train station. And I, I really like the idea too, of like, you know, predators and prey, like having to go to work together and live peaceably in the suburbs. That's fine. Um, <laughs> and then I, 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 I just have these things that I just do. Um, so so a, a couple of years ago I, I got an iPad and and decided I should one of the reasons I wanted one was because I found that I had so many students working on them and sometimes they wouldn't listen to me if I gave advice because I was a traditional artist. And you know, like I'd say, well, you know, or this color here and where's your reference? Where's and they'd say, Well, yeah, but you're a painter, you know, this is I'm doing this digitally. And so I said, all right, well, so if I start working digitally, I'll still say all the same things, you know, art is art and color is color, but then I needed a body of work. And so I decided I would start illustrating puns. <laughs> um, is Someone once told me that, you know, like a joke is like the, is a great story, you know, like it's got a beginning, a middle and end, a concept, and you have to figure out what you do or don't show. You know, how do you get, how do you, how do you illustrate a word that means two things? Where does one begin and the other one end? Um, and very, and, very so, successful. Yes, yeah, so and I and I thought too, like they're 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 all real like groaners, you know. So I thought, like, what if you take like the worst joke and then you just really try to make it beautiful, you know? Really think about you know composition, color, and line, and texture, like all the things you think about when you make art. So now you're almost forcing people to look at this joke longer. Than they would ever ever want to so it's there's there's a there's a conceptual art side to it <laughs> no they're, they're they're terrific you have to you know i remember when i first turned this page crocodile tears and it's like wasn't immediate uh, maybe i'm slow but i had to think i really had to think about it it's and uh, i think the illustrator john hendrix had said something about having like a list of things that you like to draw right that if you've got if you had downtime or if you could draw anything you wanted, what are the things you do? What, are, what if someone gives you a piece of paper, what do you draw on it? And, and, and for me, you know, when, if I can't think of anything, I'll just go back to alligators and crocodiles and go, there's gotta be another joke in there. <laughs> Fun stuff. Uh, so, so I thought I would do like five or six of these before I ran out of jokes and I've so far done 400 of them. Wow. Like in between in between other things that I'm supposed to be doing. You know, if I've got an hour, I just sit down and go, all right, what's a, what's a joke? It's fun. I really, I, I really love the drawing in these things too. Killer. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I just sort of, I'll be sitting there diligently and my, my wife will be like, so what do you, you know, 
so what are you doing? I was like, it's really, really important. I have to finish this incredibly important thing right now. <laughs> and then, then I can listen, you know? Yeah. And I have to figure out, you know, what the air currents on Merlin's robe would be. <laughs> important stuff. Important stuff. So, uh, Chris Payne, I love him saying this to a class one day, a group at the academy. And you know, he said, you know, I, I've heard a lot of the other artists in here talk about experiment and taking chances and taking risks. And he's, he finally says, you're not taking a risk. He goes, the only thing of taking a risk is the piece of paper you're working on. He said, right. he said it's not like we're jet pilots or doctors or something. <laughs> We we live in we live in the uh, uh, the toy department of life. Yes. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> this is pretty funny. Love this one, poker. Yeah. See, drawing this is much less of a risk than doing it. Yeah. <laughs> but in a way, I mean, that's the kind of fun thing about art too. Is then you go like, how do you how do how do you get that point across, and also get across it like, yes, this is not a good idea. You know? <laughs> it's that. fun with that i feel like we all do that that stool is actually over in the corner of my studio that's that's what it was made for yeah this one got me when i first saw it spacula and uh you know, it's, one one thing about these is they're they're also kind of as far as they would ever get high-minded they're like an exercise in creativity which it, it goes along with what I was saying, what I love about the drawing hive thing, which is like, what can you come up with that you wasn't in your head when you woke up this morning? Right. You know, and then, and then you know, just kind of will it into existence. And, but the reason that the thing about it is that, like I said, I thought there would be like five of them. And, and I, I think ideas just have ideas. And so much of like creating a body of work is allowing them to sort of like fragment out a little bit. Like, you know, like, and, you know, it goes for like, if being a landscape painter isn't just doing one land, you do one landscape and you suddenly in there are a thousand possibilities for other landscapes. And now you've got a thousand landscapes to do. Right. Um, And, and things like this are, are like that, that the moment I thought of the only seven I could think of, there was always a, oh, but I could have done, or, oh, you could take that same word and do this. Oh, now there's seven Dracula jokes. Like vacula. <laughs> I just thought like, you know, when the werewolves come over, like an OCD vampire has to hate that. <laughs> yeah, you might think of a vampire be very uh, aware of uh, cleanliness. Yeah. <laughs> a germaphobe. Right. This is a fun one. Thanks. So then I, mm -hmm. so coming off of that Beatles and Robbie Robertson book, I got to illustrate a biography of Pete Seeger, um, which was tricky because I I love Pete Seeger. He's sort of like you know he's one of these people who was like as good as good a person as he was an artist as he was an activist, um, and had just these novel ways of like approaching problems. Like you know the Hudson River is is polluted. Maybe I'll build a hundred foot schooner to take up and down it will draw people's attention to the river and think, boy, shouldn't this be prettier than it is, you know, as a, as a concept. Um, at, but in doing a biography, he also had the, you know, complete indecency to live to his nineties. So mm -hmm. every time the page turns, he's like 10 years older doing something else. Um, you know, like his banjo fretboard gets longer at some point, he grows a beard, he builds his own log cabin, he builds a boat, his hair goes white, he, you know, he goes on TV. Um, every single page of it was some other picture making challenge that somehow still had to tie together into like a single narrative arc. Um, yeah, I had to figure out what year he would have been teaching himself piano and then what kind of record player his musicologist parents would have had in the New York apartment. You know, something, something I didn't ask you much about and I feel compelled to do we don't have to discuss every piece um they're beautiful i would love to hear the story behind every one but uh, i wanted to ask you a couple of questions about um 
you know, you raised a family as a young artist. I mean, um, you and your wife raising a family. Um, what, what can you say about that? You know, what, what how, how did that, did you, did you just not know, you know, it's just, I always thought it was, well, it's just normal for me because that's my life, you know? Right. Um, yeah. It's, it was kind of like that. It's, I sort of, and, and I came from a very supportive family, like from, from the start, um, you know, who like, I, you know, one of my dad's ideas for, for all of us was like after working in, you know, orthopedics in a pharmaceutical under a pharmaceutical company for years was sort of like, if, if you can avoid working for the man, I would really like to see that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then my, my wife has actually early on in raising our children. Um, she was laid off from her job as a production artist. She actually had like a life changing accident where she destroyed her drawing hand in a slip and fall. Ooh. And, um, and we decided that she would manage me. So, so we've, <laughs> we've, cultivated this life where you know she'll do invoicing and taxes and read contracts keep track of what's coming in put in my email while i'm drawing and sketching and painting and running off to teach and she'll schedule private lessons and and so we we sort of piece this together by sort of like not stepping on each other's toes while working on all the same things mm -hmm. um and at the same time that but that also gave me like amazing support with like the kind of family we wanted to create where where we kind of didn't want what I was doing to be like scary, you know, like, you know, be quiet. Dad's working. Like is not how you want your children to think about art. But at the same time, there is a be quiet. Dad's working <laughs> side to it. Right. Like, how do you, how do you make, how do you raise a family where this is important to it, but it, it doesn't also you know, tell them to keep away. Um, you know how, and it, it came down to even just like picking a house that was like, I, I I don't we didn't we both agreed that we kind of didn't care how big anything on the first or second floor was as long as the attic was walkable. Hmm. You know, so like so the house is just like everything is small except for this three hundred square foot attic. And uh, because I assume the, your studio, yeah, my studio, and then and then like the rule, like and then the the boys just were were not allowed up here while I was working. Like I could invite them up. But but like the space had to stay like kind of sacred. Um, yeah, that's that that's good. The bound the boundaries. I mean, I I had those to a certain extent. Um, yeah, it's it worked you know, pretty well. But every it, now and then, someone would sneak up, and that made it sort of fun that they managed to sneak up. Yeah, like, yeah the rules got broken. We weren't brutal about it, but it was. But but what I was doing had to be serious, and that's that's all. Some people have in art going into art have trouble with that finding other people in their lives who actually do take it as seriously right. as, as, as you do to have to do it for your life. Um, you know, that, that you'll realize that the art, you know, like music was like that for me too, where, you know, once I had children, I, you know, I should have thought, well, do I keep playing in bands and writing music and doing this or, but I didn't, I actually sort of thought of like, boy, it was really depressing when I was a kid starting out. And people would come up to me and was like, well, enjoy it now, because one day you're going to have a family and you're going to stop doing all that stuff. Because, you know, people love telling you that when you're someone who draws or, you know, a teenager who draws or paints. Um, and so I, I, I wanted my kids to, like, grow up looking at me as someone who actually still did the things I wanted to do to inspire them to do the things they wanted to do and not think like, all right, and now there's going to be a hard cutoff to this where you're never going to have fun again. <laughs> No, that that's good. That's a great way to look at it. Um, you know, I, I like my my kids come and look. You know, they're adults now, and they maybe a little bit of role reversal where I'm the child, <laughs> a little bit of that, but but not much. They they know how serious I am about it. Um, but uh, the, you know, they you know, one's a environmental scientist and the other's a very serious has a very serious job at an engineering firm and you know i think they look at me like well dad's you know dad's yeah. color <laughs> as, as it is my neighborhood is now full of like young couples having kids and every time i see someone with a stroller i think like i'm not ready for that there's no way i'm stable mature and enough to start raising a family 
Yeah. And my kids are 22 and 19. Yeah. Um, mine, are, mine are 22, 28, and 32. So right. um, then you started a little later than I did, I yeah. think. Um, well, you're a lot younger, too. Yes, so yeah. I shouldn't say that. You probably started, I just forget how much younger you are. Yeah, right. um, so uh, one more question before, because there's some paintings coming up here that I want to talk about, but the um, the teaching aspect of what you do. Um that was something, you know, I think it ties in to what I was asking about family. I mean, there's some security there. There's, you know, insurance and things like that. Maybe. Yeah. There. Well, actually, the way I do it, there isn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, I've had to do all of figure all of that stuff out, all the grown up stuff I've had to figure out on my on my own. Um, and by on my own, I clearly mean with my wife doing 90 percent of it because she's the grown up. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's. But, but it has stability. It's like in most years I've done better as an artist than as an educator, but being an educator pays on time. Yeah. It's, it's consistent. You know, yeah. it's like, like knowing that having some idea that of what's coming in every two weeks, even if that's not the bulk of, of what, what it takes to live is, is you can work with that. Yeah. Um, at the same time, it's like weird to me that people can start January and know from then to December what's going to happen. I I never know that. So. Right, right. <laughs> it's, it's it's so it's so novel to me that that you know that, that I, mean, I I know educationally what's going to happen. I mean, it just yes. happens to be my program. You know, yeah, so right. things that 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 and, and I, I, I've always enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. I don't think I haven't done very well teaching for somebody else. I've tried it. Um, that I, I just, you know, I always look at it and say, well, this could be better. This could mm -hmm. be, I mean, there could be something, you know, how could I help these people better? I always thought that, and that's, that's how, how some programs got started along the way. Um, back to the artwork. Uh, so the, what are these for? These, um, I, I just want to, you know, everything I do is like an excuse to do. Um, these were an excuse to, to paint paintings and to explore some other things that I was interested in, um, which are like these, these blends of like, you know, realism and abstraction or high art and low art, the higher art, low art, you, you may not get immediately from this, but I was looking at my children underwater one day at like a hotel pool, um, after a family funeral of all things. Um, and I had been playing in the water with them and then they were just becoming like two, they were, they were actually kind of jerks that day. So I got out of the pool and I was watching my like nine year old and 12 year old swim around. And like every time they went underwater, they just transformed. They'd stretch out, they'd get small, they'd split in two. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I started thinking about is, is like, you know, like that, you like there's very little caricature in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, you know, like the high art way of looking at the world is not a world where people get long and skinny or get big noses or get, you know, short and stout. You know, we don't, we don't exaggerate, you know, to this degree and get taken seriously. And then I was thinking like, but there's all these times in our actual lives where that just happens to us. You know, there are fun and house mirror effects in the world. What, um, a, what a great subject matter to explore. Um, I have a, a teach a, a painting class right now. And one of the students, that was their subject matter. That, that was the genre that they were working in. And I kept thinking the whole time and really good that they, they were very good at it. And I kept thinking, man, the latitude or the, 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 uh, the, the breadth and the, of what you can bring with that subject matter is endless. I mean, you could be really straightforward and you could just, you could be completely abstract. Um, it's what, a, what a great way to handle the subject matter. Yeah. And, and then I've always been fascinated too, by people like, like, you know, for instance, C.F. Payne's people, sometimes those pictures are funny. Sometimes they're not actually funny. Like sometimes he caricatures someone and it's dignified. Right. Like Stephen yeah. Brogner tackles like incredibly heavy things with drawings of funny looking people that aren't funny. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sometimes they are. But there's this he, this amazing ability to handle exaggeration and grotesquery and still make them, you know, know what line of ridiculous you're on. And so I was, I was interested in that. And then I was also interested in the, I, as I started working on them, 
I just loved the idea that you know, sometimes realism is abstract too. Like that there are moments where things are, you know, it, it, this gets us into influences again. Like these were really influenced by like, I love what Turner does, but I could never be Turner. But one of the things that I, I loved about Turner is like, you know, years before Impressionism, he found excuses to be an abstractionist. You know, he, he was like, well, what if this train is moving really fast in a cloud of smoke while it's raining in the fog? <laughs> you know, what if, what if I paint Parliament while it's on fire at night reflected in the river? Yeah. You know, what if, and everything is really, like- Really thing. unusual looks, you know, um, Sargent did some paint, paintings like that too. Um, I One of my favorite paintings of his is of a, when he was in Morocco and, uh, his view of these, he did a, several of them, these view of these staircases and, and they become complete abstractions, but it's reality, you know, and it's just finding a way to do that in a vehicle yeah. to do that, to paint that way. Um, this, the, I love this painting. It's a beautiful painting. Thank you. This is, this was one of my favorites of the series. Um, you know, I, I had this gone that idea of like, you know, so again, like Sergeant the world in these abstract terms and um you know turner seeing the world in abstract terms there was a massive like deep corn retrospective in in new york like while i was in grad school i think it was either like maybe it was the year right after but i talked to this i i had a thesis advisor who was this recently deceased painter named duncan Hanna, and we we were talking about deep corn and he said do you ever find like did you find when you went to that show and you looked around that when you've been surrounded by deep corns you walk out into the world and the world is a demon corn, like space just organizes itself in front of you, like a demon corn, like buildings and street lights and the blue sky and the you know, it just turns. You know, suddenly the world turns into, you know, uh, you know, an an ocean park painting. Yeah, well, and and the ocean park series is much more sim much more abstracted than uh, uh, some of his some yeah. of his. But uh, I, but I love watching like there's that little cusp where they're sort of getting that way where, yeah. you know, those early abstractions start to turn into landscapes and he starts to go maybe I'm painting landscapes, yeah. maybe I'll do that, and then they just start to getting more and more organized, and you know the thought you can see the thought kind of happening and going well if I'm just organizing space why don't I just organize space? Yeah, it be, it, it became more and more creative and more and yeah. more his his designing what again some of it you know i'm convinced some of it was just from memory where mm -hmm. didn't have anything to do with looking at anything no no like i think you know he did observational sketches and then just extrapolated from them yeah uh great painter um yeah and so i, I obviously never met him but um I've, I've listened to a couple of interviews of his and he seemed to be a very real person, you know, accessible. Uh, there's a great uh, interview with him and uh, Charles Corral, um walking through his studio and his property. He said something that was like, so, so funny. It was like, a, uh, they were walk. he lived in like uh, close to Carmel, California, a large piece of property. And, they're walking down by this little pond and he said, Oh God, I hate when I come down here and I forget. He goes, almost, I've been telling myself remember, to remember to bring your sketchbook. And I just thought that was such an honest thing for an artist to say because of that art guilt just kind of hit him. Oh, here I am again and I don't have it with me. And so even Diebenkorn had a little bit of art guilt there. I thought that was a really <laughs> cute little segment and very, very real. Um, it was also the interview that he said, uh, Charles asked him, he said, I see all these paintings around the room and, he says it. He said, "How do you know when they're done?" And he he looked at him and he kind of smiled. He goes, "Well, when I can't figure out what to do with them, <laughs> what else to do to them?" And I was like, "Well, that is so that that is a that's a real answer, you know." I, it, it reminds me so much of this this anecdote. Come at the, at the end of the academy when we all went to your dad's house and visited his studio, and you know we're looking around and things. And there was a, a, a woman in the program who you know, was looking at, you know, he had boxes that were ready to ship out. He had boxes that had come, just come back in from FedEx. And she said, you know, so, so when, you know, you, you ship out this work, it gets, when it comes back, like, what do you, 
what do you do with all these paintings? And, you know, she meant like, do you put them in a flat file? Do you exhibit them? Do you sell them? Do you burn them? What do you do? And he went, well, I, I, I open them up and I finish them. <laughs> yeah, and I, he repainted it. I mean, you couldn't leave anything in a studio. I, was, I remember a gallery owner um, uh, saying, I have a buyer. I need to, I sent a, a piece that went back like last year. And he goes, I have a buyer for that piece. And he came to pick it up. He's like, this isn't the same painting. He said, well, you left it here. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I, I, I loved kind of like the idea there's there, cause there's multiple ways that pictures have a life of their own. Like, so this is a book I illustrated about UFOs and it's very nonfiction, just questions type book. And so I, I had to like push into it. This there's a little story narrative that only happens in the illustrations as the text takes you through. But um, you know, as I'm doing it, you know, one of the things that we do as illustrators is, you know, I, you make paintings and in this case, they disappear for six months to a year and then a book comes out. And then over the course of the next months, it gets reviewed. People make, people buy it or they don't buy it, you know? Um, but your relationship with the art usually is done. Uh, and then everyone else's relationship starts. You know, so like my favorite published illustrations, I they didn't become my favorite until, you know, Gary Kelly hadn't looked at it in a year. <laughs> um, and so so your your relationship with it will end and then someone else's begins. But the thing I loved about that story with your dad is that our relationship with it begins with the assumption that that's all there is to it. But his relationship could keep going. There was almost like, you know, it, it's like you're thinking about like the physics of the universe while like, you know, eating your breakfast. Like, like well, I'm going to start my day. And you're like, the universe is going, I don't, what is this thing you call a day? We're just going to keep going. <laughs> We talked a little bit about this, this page. Uh, this was such a fun story you were telling about. Just explain quickly what's going on. Right. So I, this is, I, I was approached by the editor of Weird New Jersey magazine, which is a, it's this, if you're in New Jersey, you know what this magazine is. It's everywhere. And Mark Moran, Mark Moran and Mark Skirman publish it. But Mark Moran will, he's been on like Unsolved Mysteries as like one of the talking head experts and things like that. And we've known each other for years. And he sent me an email with a Super 8 video of this event saying, this exists. I don't know what to do with it in magazine form, but maybe you can think of what to do with it. And so I, I produced this four page or this eight page, four, four page mini comic of the saga of this whale that washed up on the shores of uh, Long Beach Island and eventually is blown up with dynamite um, by this kind of loose cannon character who actually, from my research, I think he actually underbid the construction company he worked for, for the contract to remove the whale. <laughs> and then he starts, gets two guys to cut it up with chainsaws to try to throw it back in the ocean. And, and when that doesn't work, they try to tow it away and it breaks the tow truck. And then somehow he has like hundreds of sticks of dynamite that he just fills this thing he blows it up like five times uh, and all he does is just make a mess um so in it and in, in the end this, the city still had to come and like clean bulldoze the beach and clean off all the shore houses that, oh. that were now covered in fermented whale and as i'm researching it so i'm like re researching this this like old like you know shaky hand video and and I was getting all these dead ends until I started looking at like the crime logs from this period. And then I could put together a biography of the guy who blew up the whale because <laughs> he, just, he just spent his entire life just scamming people and getting taken to small claims court like over and over and over again. That had to be a tremendous amount of fun. It was, this was like, it, I, I felt like I'd have rock, like I was like going, I'm getting to do this and it's for weird New Jersey. Like, like my, <laughs> I, I don't know if people can understand if anyone will understand what what this means to me on my resume, but to me this is this is as good as I I'm going to get. That's awesome, <laughs> great story. All right, so uh, this this was your first right that's yes. uh, author illustrator book, and I always give somebody an opportunity to promote something. So here yeah, you this go. is 
this came out in um, summer of 2021 when we thought we were out of a pandemic and then we sort of like hunkered back down. So I was doing, you know, book signings and doing talks that were virtual and really trying to, to get it out there. And I'm working on the sequel to it right now. Uh, but this is when people say, so what do you do? I, I just tell them this book because it, it really was like, this was, this was all the things that I meant to do with my life in 1996 that someone finally let me do. <laughs> um, that, you know, that it's, it's, it's how I feel about childhood. It's why my, my target audience and my, my emotional peers are all seven years old. And, uh, where, where can we buy the book? Uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes contracts are written where if you order it on Amazon, the royalty takes a dent. Um, with this one, the contract was actually pretty fair. So I get the same royalty, no matter where it's purchased. So you can just order it on Amazon, but I'd recommend going to your local independent shop and asking them to order it. That's nice of you. Um, Adam, I think that's a great way to say thank you and absolutely tremendous amount of fun talking to you. Um, wow. And I, I'm, I feel very fortunate to reconnect with you and um all the fun drawing nights that we've done uh it's just been terrific thank you for being a part of my life and uh um being and being such a great contributor to everything we do i i feel very much the same way all right everybody Thanks, have man. a great day thank you so much adam take care